Um, I am Casey Russell. I am the president of, president of the Adams State University Alumni Association, and I welcome you to our, our homecoming banquet. Welcome home. Uh, before we call the meeting to order, uh, please join us in singing the alma mater. Uh, the alma mater will be performed by Je Janine Holcomb, accompanied by Gabe Swanson. Uh, you'll find the words in your in your your program. Please stand. to have our annual meeting for the Alumni Association. Our bylaws require that we establish a quorum. Could I please have all Adams State alumni stand? Excellent. Madam Secretary Holly Family, do we have a quorum? Excellent, then the quorum has been established. Started. I would also like to share the mission statement of the Alumni Association. The mission of the Adams State University Alumni Association Board of Directors is to reach out to the current alumni, the future alumni, and the community in order to cultivate loyalty, pride, and commitment to Adams State College, or Adams State University. Ooh, that's been old. That's old. <laughs> Better mark that one out. Uh, if there's no other business, we will continue on with our, our banquet. I, I have a few introductions to make um, at the head of the table this evening. Of course, we have our, our Adam State President, Dr. David Savaldi, and his wife, Virginia Savaldi. Thank you, Dr. Savaldi, for, for your support of the Alumni Association. Um, also, award winner, Eric Van de Bogart and his wife, uh, Sue Ann. Uh, Lori Lasky, the Director of Alumni Relations. Also, award winner, uh, Jim Biundo and his wife, Antoinette. And award winner, Kathy Parks Wubert and her husband, Henry. I would also like to point out a few others in the room. Um, if they could please raise their hand. Uh, Gaylene Horning, the program coordinator. Uh, Gaylene spends a tremendous amount of time. 
Gaylene spends a lot of time preparing for homecoming, uh, and so we appreciate that, Gaylene. Also, Tammy Lopez, the executive director of the foundation. <laughs> Linda Rallier, the assistant director of communications, who works on the A Stater. <laughs> and Mark Schoenecker uh, is back there filming the event. Okay, now I'd like to present a few of the, the board members in, in the different, different areas. If they could please stand and then uh, we'll announce their names and then we'll, we, can, we can clap for them. Um, the first is the Adams State University Board of Trustees. Um, if those members who are present could please stand. And those are Arnold Salazar, Val B. Hill, Rob Benson, Benjamin Evans, and James Trujillo. Thank you. <laughs> if the members of the Adams State University Foundation Board could please stand. All right, those, those include Dwayne Bussey. Dwayne Bussey, Russ Ockets, uh, I should say Russell Ockets, sorry. Um, Randy Jackson, Chuck Owsley, Rich Ginga, Dorothy Lucero, Kathy. and Kathy Mullen, sorry. <laughs> Will the members of the Alumni Association Board please stand? And those are uh, myself, Holly Felmy, Robert Orndorff, Brian Ro Rosbert, Richard Skinga, and Delsey Worthy. <laughs> uh, I would also like to take time to recognize the past alumni award winners, uh, the past outstanding and, excep and exceptional alumni award winners, if they could please stand. All right. We have Charlotte Lobisky, Don Stegman, Dwayne Bussey, Denise Trujillo, Harry Hull, and Randy and Micah Jackson. I hope I didn't miss anybody, um, but I believe that concludes the introductions for now. Uh, you may go ahead and start eating, and please enjoy your meal. Excuse me, lady, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please continue to eat, but we will, we will start our, our, our award presentation so that we can get everything accomplished before the next event start. Um, also, we would like to, to thank Sodexo for the wonderful meal. If we could give them a round of applause. Very, very good meal. Um, we also would like to give uh, special recognition to the reunion groups uh, for this year. Um, if the following groups would please stand. And as they stand, if we could just hold our applause until, until we announce all of the groups. Even the rowdy ones will, will, will see. We'll see, who, we'll see who wins that one. Um, the following class, 1953. Class of 1958. And if you could please stand, if you're, if you're not eating. Um, class of 1963, class of 1968, class of 1973, class of 1978, class of 1983. There we go. Yeah, that was the winners. Class of 1988. Class of 1993, class of 1998, class of 2003, class of 2008, 
and the members of the Adam State Band. Now I'd like to introduce uh, the president of Adam State University, Dr. David Savaldi. Dr. Savaldi. Thanks, Casey. Let me add my welcome to Casey's enthusiastic welcome at the beginning of our gathering. Uh, it's just great to be together again and to see so many good old friends with an emphasis on the good, not on the old. Um, my dad always said that uh, aging isn't for sissies, but it beats the heck out of the alternative. So, really glad to have you all here. Uh, on a little more serious note, I would like, if you did not hear, to take a few minutes or take a few seconds and for a moment of silence in, the, in memory of uh, uh, former President Marvel's wife, Fran, who passed away from us about two weeks ago. And uh, Fran, as you all know, was a great lady. Uh, she was proud of the, the Appalachian uh, First Lady of Adam State, and uh, she'll uh, really live in our hearts forever. So let, let's think about Fran. Also think about John Sr., because Doc, Dr. Marvel and Fran were together for 68 wonderful years, and I, and I know this week there's a, probably a special hole in his heart. So. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a, also a, a welcome to one of the special uh, members of the band uh, who has made a wonderful donation to Adams State University. Uh, Ms. Selena Landis has, is donating a, a absolute pristine uh, jacket, uh, a band mom's jacket, which we will put on display. And I will say, it does say Indian on the back. <laughs> it's, it's a great, and we really appreciate it, Selena. I did just a quick update about how we're doing here at Adam State. Uh, our enrollment remains strong. Uh, this fall we have 3,074 general fund degree seeking students versus 3,050 this time last year. We had a little, kind of a little dip in returning juniors and seniors that we're working on. And we have a record number of graduate students enrolled. I think I was the, as when I looked this, this morning, it was 936 graduate students, which is the most ever in Adam State's history. Uh, we also recently had a, a visit from our uh, regional accrediting body, which, that's the Higher Learning Commission of the North Central Association, which is uh, headquartered in Chicago. To uh, we made a request for that visit to to uh, give us a checkup to see if uh, that accreditation body believes that we are ready to deliver a PhD in counselor education. Uh, that team came and went. We received from them a site visit that was probably the most positive Higher Learning Commission uh, focused visit recommendation that I've ever seen, that Dr. Novotny has ever seen. There are a couple of more, of more little bureaucratic things we have, hoops we have to jump through, but I'm confident in saying that we will soon start offering Adam State University's first PhD program. And, and the kudos for that should go to the Counselor Education uh, Department that has a, a long history here at Adam State and just full of hardworking, great individuals, and we appreciate them very much. Uh, if you walked around campus today, you could see that our various building projects are narrowing down into one. Uh, one is in process. Uh, you probably saw it as darned hard to miss. Uh, if you walk north past the campus green in Plocky Hall, you will see a giant white bubble which encloses a new 2,000 meter indoor track. Um, now I've already heard some students talking about it today. I think right now it's called Moby Bubble. Uh, but we're excited about it. It will allow our, our uh, uh, nationally recognized track and field program to host. Now we haven't been able to do that because we've lacked that facility. And we will be hosting the RMAC uh, championships this spring. And we look forward to that. I urge you to tour our remodeled as well as our new facilities, including the Music Building, McDaniel Hall, and Plackey Hall, as well as the Rex Stadium and the residences at Rex, Gerald Hall, and most of Coronado Hall. The newly required East Campus building 
what some of you might remember of as a, the Evans School, or even, even as a junior high for, for some of you, has been partially remodeled. Um, and besides being the new home for the, the Human Performance and Physical Education Department, will house many Richardson Hall offices on a temporary basis because of the next project I'll mention. Our newest project is a long overdue, it is a complete reprogramming and remodel of Richardson Hall. I think you all remember Richardson. It's a $22 million project, which will restore that 90-year-old building to, its, to historic splendor, as well as making it more comfortable workplace, more energy efficient, and the auditorium, which is really the only venue of its kind in, in San Luis Valley, in an area the size of the state of Connecticut, is going to be redone, and, that, and that's going to be a fine, fine performance facility for the use of our theater program and our music program. Uh, we're re really excited about this. Um, I think if you come back in 18 months or so to tour, you'll see something that would make Governor, Evan, Governor Adams and, and uh, President Plocky uh, very proud. Um, now, I've talked about things that have changed. I would just mention some things that have not. What, what hasn't changed is that we have a great faculty at Adams State. We may change our buildings, you know, we may grow, uh, but the, the heart of the campus remains the same, and, and the excellence that the, our faculty bring to our students uh, in every program, to as, you, as your experience was when you were here, that remains the same. And, I, and I'd like any of our faculty that are president or any formal faculty who are retired or alumni, to, to please stand up so we can give you a round of applause. Virginia and I are very happy to welcome you home. Please enjoy your time. Thank you, Dr. Savali, for the updates on the on Adam State. Appreciate that and the hard work that you do, and uh, again, your support. We'll now um, move on to our our presentations. Our first presentation is the, the exceptional new alumna, and I would like to ask Rhonda Shoniker to share with us just a little bit about the about the our 2013 exceptional new. Uh, alumna, uh, Kathy Park Wilbert, um, if Rhonda could please come forward. Hello, I'm Rhonda Shoniker, and I'm honored, very honored, to introduce to you Kathy Park Wilbert, and I'm so uh, honored that she has invited me to do so. And in a way, I met Kathy before I ever saw her. It had to be my first semester at Adams as a student in spring 99, when the art department was still located in the now Community Partnerships building. Kathy had some very fine and juicy sculptures in a show. And to me, her art wordlessly communicated an honest human story, and it left me curious to know more and more about her and what the story was. The first time I actually did meet Kathy, she was the instructor of my Aikido class at Adams, and I had never seen a woman move like her, just an elegant flash of light, or maybe a slow, graceful unfolding in a, in a demonstration. Uh, like me, with my funky back, there were a few other people in the class that couldn't do the mat work. And Kathy offered us another version that still included focused movement, body and, uh, body and energy awareness exercises, and the philosophy of peaceful reconciliation. And writing. I was deeply awed when I learned that this accomplished, vibrant woman was also the artist I had discovered in the Hatfield Gallery. Kathy came into our lives again as an Aikido instructor, but this time we had enrolled our six-year-old nephew into her class. Brian came to live with us when he was almost four, and typical of displaced children, he had lots of things to work out. He could be very aggressive towards other kids. He'd get anxious in groups or over loud noises, and at the slightest provocation, he'd lash out. The gingerbread staff even asked me to find another situation for Brian's childcare. In kindergarten and first grade, sometimes Brian would run off and hide 
if he became overwhelmed and everything was fright or flight. You might think that enrolling Brian in a martial arts class would make him even more aggressive or even dangerous. But remember, Aikido is the art of peaceful reconciliation. But Brian wasn't very peaceful in Kathy's class or anywhere for quite a while. He would get agitated or frustrated and move into fight mode. He would, he would, um, Kathy or Henry, who co-taught the class, would redirect him. Often he would choose to wander off the mat or maybe down the hall when things didn't go his way. I watched these meltdowns happen over and over at every Aikido class. And finally, in despair, I, I asked Kathy if she wanted me to stop bringing Brian. And without hesitation, she said, oh no. Everything that's happening here is right on time and we're all learning from Brian. They accepted him for who he was and exactly where he was with love and without judgment. To see adversity as an opportunity and diversity as an asset clears the way for creativity and healing and Kathy and Henry were walking the talk. That perspective ripped my heart wide open and transformed the way I thought about parenting, about Brian's needs, his gifts, his journey, and I'm still learning from that moment. Brian actually did work out a bunch of his issues in Aikido without maiming anyone. Brian is 16 now, and I asked him recently what made Kathy so special to him, and he said, when I wanted to give up, Kathy would persuade me to keep going in one way or another. She made me realize I had power over myself and it helped me to stop getting angry. And that's it. She connected me with my own power. This is a brief, incomplete sketch of how Kathy impacted our family. And by the way, Henry has never been an innocent bystander in any of this. His understanding and commitment to Kathy speaks of his true depth and ability to sustain and inspire her. In 2003, Kathy decided to pursue a career in chiropractic care and learned that she would have to first get some other requirements out of the way, like a bachelor's degree. No small feat. She knew I had previously navigated the scholarship programs and benefited from several awards, so she looked me up and undaunted jumped right in herself. After a disappointing look behind the veil at the chiropractic school in Dallas, I asked her not to hold it against any other Texans. Uh, she changed directions again and got a degree in English from ASU, truly excelling and graduating summa cum laude and earning a full ride scholarship to Leslie in Boston for an MFA in creative writing. When Kathy returned MFA in hand and became my colleague, I witnessed once again how she guided students beyond their boundaries, beyond what they expected of themselves. She dared to teach novels like Push by Sapphire and Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried to no doubt startled English freshmen. Our classes sometimes intersected in the library lab and I occasionally asked students about her class. I heard nothing but shining reviews. One person said, it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> but I'm growing in unexpected ways and I really love it. She was filling in empty spaces and opening new ones, shoring up confidence, challenging, and best of all, provoking students to ask questions and explore on their own connecting with their own story, their own power. As any educator knows, that equals a hell of a lot of work for the teacher. But Kathy's not, knowing for do, not known for doing things halfway. She walks the walk, and it's my honor to introduce my friend, colleague, and mentor, Kathy Park Roller. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, Kathy, would you please approach the podium? 
Excellent. <laughs> it is our pleasure to present this plaque to you as the 2013 <laughs> exceptional new alumna. We appreciate you and all the hard work that you've done and uh, congratulations and continued success. Okay, glasses. Thank you, thank you, Rhonda. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, sorry, Julie Wechter's not here. She's the one who nominated me. So, if after this speech you have some feelings, if she had the, made the wrong choice, then you can deal with her. Um, thanks to ASU for honoring me with this award, um, and also thank you, Henry, for being such a big part of my story. So. Basically, I kind of want to tell you my story because great stories begin here. Um, I, what's happened since I graduated in 2007 is so full of unexpected twists and turns that sometimes I wonder if I'm the author of my own story. Um, but here's the backstory: I'm a classic boomer, a child of the 60s. Um, Although I had enough smarts to be accepted at Radcliffe at one point, and I attended two years of Antioch, I dropped out of college in 1971. Why? Because I was majoring in drugs. Lucky for me, I must have retained enough brain cells to realize that I was wasting my parents' hard-earned money. And like so many others, I was caught up in the general confusion and turmoil of the times, uh, anti-war protests, women's liberation, civil rights, black power movement, you name it. Some of you may remember. Um, but lucky for me, uh, dropping out of college didn't mean the end of my education. To the contrary, I began to navigate a self-directed, lifelong education that has focused on art, the body, writing, and teaching. And horses are in there somewhere, too, as you'll see. Uh, so my arts education was strongly influenced by two different uncles. One was very famous, the figurative painter David Park. Um, I never met him, but I grew up with his paintings and discovered at a young age how to work with line and color and shape. Um, when I was in my 20s and 30s, my other uncle, a sculptor named Gordon Newell, mentored me through a 15-year stone carving apprenticeship. Um, a subject about which I wrote in a memoir called Seeing into Stone, A Sculptor's Journey. Gordon taught me to keep my tools sharp, go with the grain, and develop the kind of patience and persistence that can carve stone, chip by chip. I learned from both uncles that art will always be the central theme of my story, and I continue to carve wood and stone, paint, make masks, fiber art, I will go, wherever art takes me. Uh, my lifelong story, the study of the body, stems from growing up with handicapped family members and my own evolving vision problems. Um, my father returned from World War II in the Pacific uh, with polio, which decimated his upper body. Uh, later, my younger sister was born with spina bifida, which crippled her lower body. And as you can see, those of you who are close enough or don't have vision problems of your own, you can see that one of my eyes has kind of opted out of looking at the world. Um, my study of the body has led to a number of different uh, alternative body therapies and the nonviolent martial art of Aikido, as Rhonda mentioned, which I have practiced and taught for 35 years. Uh, although I'm not doing formal practice right now, the principles of Aikido grounding, centering, extending energy, 360 degree awareness, inform how I approach my life, and lately, horses. I'm currently working on a manuscript titled, uh, tentatively titled, From Revenge to Reconciliation, How Aikido Principles Can Help You Stay Sane in a Crazy World. Um, sometimes we don't see parts of our own story coming, um, those unexpected plot twists take us by surprise, as if the characters grabbed the pen away from you and started writing the story. Um, for example, I never would have imagined that I would volunteer for four years in a women's prison, where I founded a holistic health program for inmates and staff alike. 
I'm pretty sure the prison's motto was not great stories begin here. <laughs> um, nevertheless, many of the women I was honored to work with did begin great stories in prison. They not only began to write about their lives, they began to consciously reconstruct their lives, their stories based on new criteria, help, hopefully more healthy criteria. Um, I wrote about this as well, um, kind of a homemade book, which I hope to revise and publish, titled Soaring Over the Wall, Wall a Volunteer's Collection of Freedom Stories. Okay, but the most surprising plot twist in my story was my decision to return to college at the overripe, non-traditional age of 53, thanks in large part to Henry's encouragement. Upon admittance at ASU at the time graciously informed me that none of my college credits 33 years prior would be accepted. And I, I'm not sure if they knew about the majoring in drugs part, but they might have known that. Yeah, I, instead, I was granted probationary status, and I had to start from the very beginning. Even though my fellow students were young enough to be my children, and in some cases, my grandchildren. Four years later, I graduated with a 4.0 GPA, with a major in creative writing and a minor in theater. So, um, thanks for taking a chance on me. Um, I liked the feeling of my brain working so much that I took another big risk when I decided to go on to grad school, and sorry, Rhonda, but I did not get a full ride to grad school, I wish. No, 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 no. Uh, with Henry's support and guidance, I graduated in 2010 from the distance learning program at Lesley University in Cambridge, Mass, with an MFA in creative writing, nonfiction. Um, those folks, my mentors there, helped me birth and publish my memoir, and they also encouraged me to teach. So that brings me to the part of the story I'm pretty sure the ASU administration does not know about, which is that I began teaching here at ASU before I got my MFA, and actually it's worse than that. Um, my ASU teaching career began even before I graduated from here. Um, remember when phys ed was a gen ed requirement? Remember? From 1999 to 2002, I taught Aikido and conflict resolution through Aikido down at Plaquey Hall. In 2007 and 2008, I also taught Aikido for actors and movement for puppeteers. So thank goodness not everyone plays strictly by the book. Um, it makes for a much more interesting story. Um, but back to how I started teaching English here. Um, Aaron Abeda is not here tonight. He asked me to substitute for his creative writing class. And in that class was a non-trad student who liked my teaching so much that she apparently marched over to David Maisel and told him that he should hire me, um, which he did. So I taught as an adjunct professor from the fall of 2010 until just this spring. I mostly I taught Com Arts 1 and 2, but sometimes I'd be let out of the salt mines to teach writing the 10-minute play and creative writing workshops. I've now segued into teaching through the extended studies um, portion of ASU, um, women in memoir, advanced composition, both of those are launched, and I'm working on women and drama and the prison memoir, thanks to great idea from David Maisel. So the latest chapter in my life has led Henry and me to pull up stakes and move from our home of 19 years in Horoso, Colorado, southeast of here, and to risk basically everything we had been working on. That includes jobs and income, friends and community, garden and greenhouse, security and comfort, at an age when most sexagenarians are considering their upcoming retirement where they want to go fishing. Why did we decide to move? because we are following the horses. I know, I'm not entirely sure what that means either. <laughs> Except that I've been following the horses since I was a girl. There's something about being with horses, their ability to mirror our state of mind and encourage a deep, body-based, intuitive, non-articulate wisdom that feels crucial to my evolving story as hopefully a future wise woman. As the old saying goes, there's something about the outside of a horse that's good for the inside of a person. And so that 
metaphor, follow the horses, has led us to move to Dolores, Colorado, and the beautiful Four Corners area. Apparently that move and the peculiar combination of courage and craziness that drove it is what caught Julie Wechter's eye to nominate me for this award. So, um, abbreviated version of that story, my cousin bought a horse ranch um, and Henry and I weren't able to find pasture in Hiroso for our two horses. So our cousin, Kat, trailered them over the mountain and they happily joined her herd. And this summer, Henry and I followed uh, to live on the ranch where we worked on everything ranch related, something that neither of us have any experience at. So that was fencing, gardening, irrigation, putting on horsemanship clinics, teaching Esperanza, my mare, to accept the saddle and cinnamon, her daughter, to pick up her feet. Um, I've moved cattle uh, without any experience cowboying before. I've done graphic design and publicity. Um, Henry and I have used all of our skills to help uh, facilitate clear communication and peaceful conflict resolution among the core group living on the ranch. It has been a steep learning curve. And on the last day of August this year, we closed on a sweet little property just four miles from the ranch, our own mini farm. And Sunday, after tomorrow's festivities, we go back to Hiroso to pick up my air compressor and a bunch of marble and a sculpture I've been working on for several years. They will be the last to follow the horses. I'm almost at the end. One more very short story. The other day, uh, a day when Esperanza wasn't being a brat and or running away or trying to buck off her saddle, we rode to the top of the ridge overlooking the ranch. Some of the way was clear and open. Some was rock strewn and tangled. Sometimes I saw the easy way to go, directing Esperanza with a rein or a leg or shifting by my balance. Sometimes Esperanza found the easy way on her own. We were equals in a kind of peaceful partnership I've always dreamed of having with a horse, a person, a community, a world. When we got to the top, the air was so clear I thought I could touch the cliffs of Mesa Verde just to the south. I thought about all the ancient Puebloans who may have paused in their journeys to enjoy the same view. Thinking of those spirits and their stories they've left behind help me realize that we are never the sole authors of our stories. Which way a story or a path will turn is a shared decision, a true collaboration. Sometimes you take the lead, sometimes the story leads you. May you find that curious mixture of courage and craziness to go wherever your story wants to go. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Our next award is for the Outstanding al Alumnus. This year we want to recognize James Biun Biundo, class of 1959 and 1962. Uh, Don Stegman, would you please come up and, and share with us a little bit about Jim? Thank you, Casey. Hello again. And I say, what a beautiful room this is because of Lori and Gaylene and uh, Tammy. They do such a great job and the meal was excellent. Well, Kathy, congratulations. And Eric, also to you for your honors tonight. And I'm honored. I better take out some notes. If I get talking about this guy, I'll spend way too much time. So Lori said kind of Stick to your script, huh? <laughs> it is indeed a privilege to share some background about my good friend, Jim Biundo. I'll introduce him shortly, but what a nice honor for me to be asked by him to say a few words about our backgrounds. We go back, oh my gosh, my hair is gray. I tell the barber to cut off some gray and leave the silver. That kind of thing. But we go back, he's a Trinidad native, 
and I'm Monta Vista, so we go back to some small towns, came together at Adams in, oh, 1957 thereabouts, and my gosh, we had a, a great time in those late 50s. Adams enrolled about 600 students back then, and we didn't have too big a campus. We had Richardson Hall, and we had a new science building, it's now the art building. We had uh, Harry Hall with his great meals, always as director of uh, the student center and all that. Those were good years. And you know what we found at Adams State? Some excellent professors, a great staff, and great administration. We had such people as Mr. Brooks, Dr. Throckeld, Dr. Lyman, to name a few of our major field professors, speech, theater, and English. Dr. Plucky was our president, and a great president he was. He uh, was the builder. Then, of course, Dr. Marvel followed him in 1966. After our first teaching experiences in the public schools, we again came together at Adams, hired by Dr. Plucky in 1964. We shared an office just northwest of what now is the museum on second floor, Richardson Hall. We were directors and technical directors for theater under Dale Jeffries. We also, we also shared a trunk. <coughs> if Jim, <laughs> see if I tell stories, what happened? We'd get the giggles like this. We, had, we were cast as faculty members in a summer production of the Fantastics. And we had to, in a little theater and around, we had to come out of a trunk into the playing area in front of that full theater audience. And I don't know, Jim, uh, you were sort of a, well, you had a costume. You had a feather, and you had a headband. And you had a big pillow, and you had uh, long handles, and you had a loincloth. <laughs> Dress rehearsal night have to go back to that. Dress rehearsal night was something. We came out of the trunk. We had a few in the audience, the director and cast members. And I give directions. I'm the old actor and he's my little helper. I didn't mean that, Jim. <laughs> You're always big in my eyes. Anyway, I tell him to do his gyrations. And he can't see because of that big pillow. He can't see what's happening. Dress rehearsal night, see? And he takes a few steps and all of a sudden, boom, plop, right down, right down on that pillow. It's a good thing he had the pillow. And the cast just came apart. This is dress rehearsal night. I mean, we couldn't do anything for 15 minutes. So guess what it was? The first night of production, we were in that trunk, ready to burst out into the theater in front of all those people. And we, you, you heard him laugh a little bit. Well, I, I could hear him go in that trunk. <laughs> and I was about ready to burst out too. But we came out of that trunk and we did our thing. And we made it through about four nights of production. Oh. It was a time. Our teaching experience, experiences were numerous and varied in classrooms all over the campus. We were kind of orphans on the campus. We didn't have the ES building really back then. We had classes in the science building, in the library, which is now the business building, and certainly a lot of them in Richardson Hall. Even an open area where he would start lecturing because we were both teaching freshman English. I'd listen to him a while, students, and then his class would listen to me. No, we really didn't do that, but it was, it was that close. Mr. Bundo was an excellent instructor, very enthusiastic, well-grounded in his disciplines, and he cared about each and every one of his students. In the 1970s, Jim became chairman of the Language and Literature Division with some 26 faculty under his leadership. Again, he was outstanding in that position. Later, under the presidency of Dr. Marvel, Jim became director of public relations. In that role, he helped bring Adams State, Alamosa community, even the San Luis Valley together. He did an excellent job. It didn't surprise me uh, that Jim, after he left Adams in 1981, that his professional community experience enhanced his later positions. At Pima College in Tucson, 
Kirkwood College, Rapid City, and many years as assistant to the president at Southern Missouri State University. He also published many poems and a couple or three books. As busy as he was, Jim always made time for his family. His wife, Antoinette, was an outstanding teacher for the Alamosa School District. I think I was a school board member back then or something. <laughs> Here tonight are Terry, Kim, and Tammy, the three daughters. I remember them when I knock on a door, the Bundo house. They thought my name was Don Stegman. It came out like that. What was the one? <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. that? That's fine. They don't. They were beautiful little girls back then, and they're still beautiful. Well, I can't leave the podium without telling one little quick story about a fishing trip <laughs> at Smith Reservoir back in the late 60s. Jim was in the back some, a Saturday afternoon, nice warm day, and all of a sudden I, say, I hear him say, whoo, got one. He reeled that fish in, it's a beautiful rainbow, and uh, I get ready to launch forward, I gear shift, and I hear the motor go, hmm, hmm. I lost my propeller. Jim says, Don, what are we gonna do? He says, I barely made it in the Marines. I couldn't swim, I can't swim. I said, well, what can we do? I said, let's hold up oars. We won't have to paddle so hard. Maybe somebody in shore will see us. And sure enough, somebody came out with a boat and towed us in. But uh, that was really kind of fun. And after that, Jim bought a boat. <laughs> At least it had a propeller. <laughs> yeah. Inboard boat. Guess what he put on the side of that boat? He named it the Italian Heritage. That's on my boat. <laughs> he used to pull a girl water ski and that kind of thing. I'll uh, be quiet and let my good friend, Jim Biondo, outstanding alumnus for Adams State College. Jim. All the stories he tells are true. I'm just very thankful he didn't tell some that he might have. <laughs> President and Mrs. Faldi, special guests and alumni, thank you. And my thanks to Don Stegman for the kind introduction. Indeed, he and I spent considerable time together here at Adams State over the years, and yes, we also managed to do a little fishing at Smith Reservoir and other places. Don remains a lifelong friend. Thank you so much, Don. My deep appreciation also to the Alumni Selection Committee, this truly is an honor, and to Lori Lasky and Linda Relier for guiding me through this process over the last couple of weeks. Thank you two so very much. You do a great job for Adam State. Let me uh, quickly, even though Don touched on it, introduce members of my family who are here. My wife, Antoinette, my, our, our three daughters, Terry Lee Day and her husband, Ron, who uh, live here in the valley, live here in Del Norte. Kimberly Peets, middle daughter, who lives in Las Vegas, and Tammy Gerstner, who lives in Kansas City. Also here is my sister, Catherine Hutchinson, who spent a considerable time living here in the Valley and now lives in Glendale, Arizona. Thanks to all of you for your love and support. Yes, my story too began here. Adam State has been such an important part of the fabric of my life and the life of my family. My wife and I both received our BA and MA degrees here and our all three daughters attended Adams State and went on to successful careers. As it has been for many students throughout its history, Adams State provided me access and opportunity. It came when I needed it most, fresh out of the Marine Corps, GI Bill in hand, seeking further direction for a career in education. Being here, and I don't see it, say this idly, was a life-changing experience for me. This is where I had some of my finest learning moments, some of my finest teaching moments, and some of my finest administrative moments. In retrospect, 
I'm sure it was because I was surrounded by excellence. Excellence in the faculty, across the academic disciplines, and in the staff who were dedicated to student success. That Adam State tradition of excellence has continued under the leadership of President Svaldi. My community service pathway also began here as I served on the Alamosa City Council, the Chamber of Commerce Board, Arts Council, and other civic groups. It's continued throughout my career, reaffirming the importance of a strong town-gown relationship, regardless of the community in which one may live. It was my good fortune to have Dr. John Marvel as a mentor, professional role model, and inspirational guidepost. He remains a special friend and colleague to me. We were saddened to learn of the passing of Fran, who was a kind and gentle woman. I would be remiss before I close if I didn't say a quick word about the City of Surprise, for which I currently serve as District 1 Council Member and Vice Mayor. A suburb of Phoenix in the Northwest, Northwest Valley, Surprise has a population of 117,000 projected to grow to over 250 to 300,000 in the next decade. Though there are several retirement communities within the city, a large segment of the population consists of young professionals who find the city a safe, attractive, comfortable place to raise their families. And I'm sure some of you may be wondering how in the world it got its name. So I must tell you, it, in, indeed it, it did get its name, as you might suspect, uh, just about in 1940, a land developer and his wife were traveling through that section of Arizona, and he was about to invest in some land there, which we now refer to as our original town site uh, in, in the city. And his wife looked at him and, and wondered about that kind of decision, saw the vast expanse of desert around there with nothing at all around and said, I will be surprised if anything ever develops here. And that's how the city got its name. In the time of our lives, we all have diverse and exciting opportunities. The challenge is always to meet those fully and directly and boldly. So that at the end of the day, one can only hope that we have touched some lives in positive ways and made some positive contributions. I leave you with these lines from the poet Archibald MacLeish, which I think sum up the importance of Adam State in my life, and I'm sure in the lives of many others. Said MacLeish, we do not know for what we wait. Wind in the elm tops or the dear sun's rising on another day. We cannot say, only that the time draws nearer. Those who wait for time to take them find within fulfilling time not what they hoped, but what they feared. The bold go toward their time. They make its meaning answer to the mind. Adam State gave me the knowledge and experience to go boldly toward my time, and for that I am forever grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Don. Um, and Jim, I'll ask you to come back up here for a second. It's our pleasure to present this plaque for the 2013 Outstanding Alumnus to Mr. Dr. James Biondo. Uh, and we congratulate him on this, this honor. Thank you, Casey, very much. Our next award is for the Billy Adams Award. Um, we'll now turn some time over to Dr. Savali. Uh, if you could please sh share with us a little bit about the Billy, 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 uh, Billy Adams Award winner, um, Dr. Savali. Kathy and Jim, my congratulations. Well, well deserved. Glad that you're here. Uh, I, I'm happy and, and, and proud to announce that uh, my friend Mr. Eric Van Bogart uh, was 
is our selection, the executive team of, of Adams State, for the Billy Adams Award for 2013-2014. Uh, I have some brief remarks. I'll, I'll let Bill, the, the person who worked the most with Eric, uh, talk about Eric. But as I said, or at least as it says in the, the uh, pamphlet there, there, there's no one more responsible for how Adams State now, the, how our physical environment looks than Eric. Uh, we have an, uh, now we have an attractive campus green and walkways that bind our north, north and south campuses together. In addition to the building projects I mentioned some time ago, Eric also oversaw the construction of Porter Hall, the science building, the new theater, renovation of Rex Gym, the remodel of the business building and the art building, which some of you might remember as the science building, the move from centralized boilers to individual uh, heating, uh, the remodel of the old steam plant into a home for computing services, and the train energy project, which is saving Adams State University thousands, thousands of dollars in energy costs and making Adams State green even greener. Eric has truly left Adams State better than he found it. And besides, anyone who rides a horse, as well as a Harley, is someone Governor Adams would have loved to have met. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen him do that simultaneously, but I think <laughs> if, if anybody could do it, it would be Eric. Uh, thank you also to Sue, to Sue Ann for sharing Eric with us for so many years. He he's, uh, always will be our friend. Uh, and so I now ask Bill Mansheim. <clears throat> our Vice President for Finance and Government, to talk about his friend, Eric. Bill. Thank you, President Savaldi. Kind of tough act, for a speech guy, an English professor, uh, Wow, I'm, I'm a numbers guy, so, um, so first uh, a few descriptors, brash, in your face, impatient, hard-headed, demanding, but enough about me. <laughs> I'm here to talk about what you don't really know the guy that I'm here to talk about, he's getting this award because he tolerated five years of working for me. Um, it's no easy task. Anyway, um, President Svaldi uh, mentioned all the things that Eric's done. And I'm, uh, I love football. And uh, I like to gamble too. And, and uh, so I play fantasy football a lot and uh, I listen to the radio. And the other, day, the other night I was driving home and trying to get some tips on who I'm going to play in my fantasy league and all this kind of stuff. And I hear the offensive coordinator uh, uh, for the uh, Minnesota Vikings talk about, uh, they had him on and they were interviewing him about what it's like to have Adrian Peterson uh, in your offense. And if those of you who are not football fans, tremendous uh, running back athlete. Um, and uh, his comment was, you know, it's wonderful having that kind of weapon, but what we have to be careful of is we don't, when we finish the year and he has 400 carries, we don't want to take the, this guy and carry him, have him carry us on his back to where we wear him down to a nub. And um, Eric is my Adrian Peterson. <laughs> he, uh, he was, uh, well, let me, st let me start first. His first stint here was in 1994 to 2002. Eight years he was here. He came here from CU. Um, started there, I believe the first thing he did was working on a project at CU, actually on a construction project with a contractor, I believe. Is that close to right? Close enough, right? And. Um, he came here to work on an energy performance uh, contract for Adams State to uh, decentralize the steam plant, which is now the computing services building, to individual, uh, uh, so that each building had its own boilers. And in doing that, he um, got to work with Jim Knudsen sitting over here. And that's uh, 1999, Jim? And uh, 
Jim and Eric, uh, from that point on, close friends, friends for life. Um, another guy sitting over here, Dan. Uh, Eric got here in, so Dan, when was that when you came? 1999. Eric had been here a little while and uh, we needed to do some work in Plocky Hall and um, we needed uh, Dan's company they do abatement asbestos and things like that. Eric had him down here and uh, was going through a proposal with several people and Eric says when can you start and when Dan's reply when when do you need me and Eric says today they went down to Walmart or wherever at the time, it wasn't Walmart, but got some stuff and went to work that day. And that's the way Eric is. He just hits the ground running and he goes. So here's some of the things. Now I'm going to tie some number to these things that he did. And, th and then I'll, um, they said I only have five minutes, so I'm going to try to, try to stick to that. Um, $12 million for um, the, the rooms you're sitting in. The solarium added onto the student union building, the Rex Gym remodel, Coronado, Dural, Pettis, Dalzell, McMurray, uh, the new housing office. That was all in the first bond issuance back in in the early mid 90s. Um, as I said, the boiler replacement that's five million. The the roofing at the library, the business school, several other buildings on campus that's another three million. ADA upgrades across back campus, another 2.8 million. Porter Hall, 11 million. Art building, three and a half million. Theater, four million. Plocky gym, a remodel on the inside. Gym bleachers, indoor outdoor track, two million. Computing services, technology, spine, smart classrooms, six million. Business school, 5.5 million. So we're hitting 60, 60 some million right there. And with every dollar, there is one piece of paper you got to file with the state. I guarantee you there's 10 million forms and things you have to do to get to that point. Um, and so then he goes, he disappears, he goes over to uh, Grand Junction and he builds more stuff over there and he's uh, doing all these things. And then I show up in 2003 and um, I'm visiting with the state architect Larry Freeberg and he's here on campus uh, with the Capital Development Committee uh, touring as they do every summer and I'm um, telling Larry about a concept we have we want to introduce this student fee so that we can revitalize our campus and I'm looking for a construction guy do you have any anybody you could recommend and he says you've got to go out and get Eric so um, I went to Grand Junction and uh, got the contact information from Larry, I called Eric and I said, Eric, I wanna, I wanna talk to you. So I went over there, we had lunch, um, told him what the plan was and what we were gonna try to do and some of the things we wanted to do and started drawing stuff on napkins and he says, oh, and we can close Stadium Drive and we can do all these things and we start talking about all this and he said, well, do you got the money in that? Well, I said, well, no, we, no. <laughs> details you know and, and so I said but we're gonna to go to our students and they're gonna have the vision and they're gonna do this trust me this is, this is gonna work so sure enough our students had the vision uh, they passed the initiative I called Eric and uh, I said I'm gonna be announcing this position please please apply that was the day that I got Adrian Peterson as my guy this guy built this campus. He did it. Right um, so now, second go around. Plocky Hall, he came in on the tail end when we had that state appropriation. We got $10 million. Community Sharp Partnership Building, $1 million grant, he did that. Uh, president's residence towards the tail end of that nightmare of a project. Um, 500,000. Uh, the nursing simulation lab, 1.2 million. Rec stadium, closure stadium drive, parking lots, um, dorms, 22, 16 million. Um, Rexfield uh, replacement, another 500,000. Geralt, 
Just north and south, five million. Coronado, A, C, and D wings. I don't know why we skipped A, A, C, D. Huh, well, it's, I'm a math guy, but it, we, nine million. Uh, energy performance contract, two and a half million. The Plocky Solar Project, we have uh, solar on top of, top of Plocky, three million. Soccer lacrosse, softball fields, parking, another million and a half. Remodel of Leon, Leon Memorial, 350,000. Music, 5.6 million. McDaniel Hall, 12 million. Baseball field, 1.2 million in the surrounding area. Library renovations, 400,000. East Campus renovations, the old Evans School, 800,000. Casa House, locker room conversions, 200,000. Outdoor track, 850,000. The bubble sitting over there, three and a half million. And now we've got 20 million coming for Richardson Hall. That's Eric. That's him. Right there. Um, so, all that said, uh, I'd like you to please welcome and, and honor um, my. Well, we never shared a trunk together. We, we didn't do that. Nor did we come out of a trunk. I've, I've never heard it phrased like that. But, um, <laughs> please, please help me in honoring my brother from another mother, Eric the Nub Van de Borgard. I'm an old cow <laughs> from the Rio Grande. I'm not. I'm actually an immigrant that moved to Colorado when I was four years old. And I've been coming to the Santa Luis Valley since I was a small child. And that was the song I sang when I came down here and interviewed for a job back in 1994. My first opportunity to come here and get employment at this wonderful institution. And that was the beginning of my story here at Adams State. It's been a wonderful ride. It's been tremendous to have the, the people, the community, the support that I've had here is unbelievable. I've been a number of places. I've been at University of Colorado at Boulder. I've been at Grand Junction. I've been here twice and I'd come back here again because the people here are so special and this place is so special. I, I received notification that I would receive this award and for the first time in my life, I responded back, I'm speechless. Because I usually am not speechless. <laughs> I have lots to say and I usually say it but it comes from a perspective that is not agenda driven. I've never had an agenda coming here except to do the will of the institution. I believe that. I believe that's what people who serve should do. You come, you see what the vision is, and you do your job. If you only put part of yourself into something, you'll gain something. If you care a lot about something, you might really achieve something. I care a lot, and there's a lot of people here that care a lot, and it, it, that's what makes it so special. You know, from, from Bill Mansheim, David Savaldi, Marv Motes, I tell you, I, I, I can't be more thrilled to have the support that I had. Dr. Fulkerson, to have the vision back in the early 90s to put together that first master plan that I got to become such a part of. That master plan developed in 1993. I remember I was told that he said, oh, 60 million or so, we'll never see that. If we get half of that, we're lucky. Well, I left here pretty much accomplishing that entire master plan except for a couple of buildings. I would have loved to have stayed here to do those buildings. I'm very, very glad I got the opportunity to come back and take the next step. So incredibly self-gratifying that words can't describe. The faith that people put in me is 
just phenomenal. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart, this place, the people, the people of the community, the contractors that I've met, the friends that I've made are forever with me. I've told my children as we moved from one place to another, my youngest being born here in Alamosa, that we're not losing anything by moving on. We're gaining, we're growing. We're not losing a thing. We haven't lost a thing by moving from here. We've gained more. And you're all welcome where I'm at, wherever I'm at. And I thank you very much. Congratulations, Eric. Uh, just to conclude, just a reminder, if you ordered shirts, you can pick them up right outside where, where you checked in at the table. Um, also, be sure to attend the, the jazz concert in Richardson Hall, or there is a com comedy improv in the theater building. Uh, tomorrow's activities will, be, will begin with the 5K run at 7.15. The check -in will be the check-in at Cole Park. At 10 o'clock, please join us for the parade downtown. Alumni are welcome to ride on the alumni float or walk beside it. Uh, we will start at the east end of Main Street in Ladue. At 11 o'clock, join us for the tailgate party on the north campus green outside the, of the stadium. Uh, there will be some inflatable, inflatable, inflatables for the, for the kids. Um, at 1 o'clock is the football game and Urias ASU Grizzlies will we'll play Black Hill State. Um, thank you for all coming out tonight. Hope to see you all back here next year um, at our annual meeting, and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>